get set. What is this pile of stuff here? I was trying to say Benito from getting cut. He said it looked like it exploded. He was very observant. All right. Just a little bit left in this chapter. So, there may still remain one error clinging to our knowledge of the processions of the persons in the Blessed Trinity from our own immersion in time. As far as the statement of it goes, we are not likely to make the error of thinking that the Son is in some way less eternal than the Father, or the Holy Ghost is in some way younger than the Father and the Son. We know that there is no succession in eternity, no change in God. God the Father did not, did not first exist as a person and then became a father. God, by the very act of being God, generates his Son. God the Father and God the Son, by the very act of being God, spirate the Holy Ghost. As I say, there is not likely to be any error in our statement of this. The error will tend to cling to our idea in such a way that when we are looking directly at it, we do not see it, yet it is profoundly there. And because time is so deeply woven into all our experience, our advance in the knowledge of God depends upon our deliberate effort to rid our minds of it. The trouble is that we have no language for what we are trying to say. We cannot make any statement at all without tenses, past or present or future. But God's actions have no tense. He has no past. He has no future. He has only an eternal present. But it is not our present, poised between past and future. It is not a tense at all. How then are we to utter God's actions with man's verbs? Our nearest tense to his timelessness is the present tense. Thus, if we say God generated his son in eternity, we are making it a past operation, at least verbally. And words do affect our thinking even when we know better. It would be closer to the reality to say God is generating his son in eternity. For it is the very essence of the father's abiding life as father to be generating his son. The trouble is that the phrase is generating, although it does convey the notion of present operation, also conveys the notion of incompleteness. The operation is still going on because the operation is not yet complete. And this also is a shadow upon the truth. The truth is that each phrase, God generated, God is generated, contains something that the other lacks. The one gives the notion of completeness, the other of present action. It may be well for the mind to use both phrases, moving from one to the other until the mind finds itself in some way seeing both in one new verb for which, there, for which it has no word. So do you understand, anybody who studied different languages, you know about tenses, right? Tenses doesn't mean you're all you know, high strung or something like that. It's, it's, you know, there are many tenses. Um, for example, you know, you, sp you study Spanish, right? And you have you know, present tense, simple past, imperfect, pluperfect, subjunctive, pluperfect, subjunctive, um, conditional, you know, and all these are, indicate a particular kind of time and place that somebody was doing something or, or whatever, or w will be doing something. And in English, we, we don't have a, a very neatly defined, you know, kind of way of saying tenses as, as Spanish might or, or French, but we still have tenses and we still use words that convey um, if it was now, if it was in the past, um, if it's going to be in the future. And all of those are a handicap to us 
when we're talking about or thinking about God is what he's trying to get you know, over to us right now. Um, there, there isn't one. So he is making us aware of that fact, not that we have much of a real solution for it. He suggests here that maybe when we think about God and the Trinity, we move our minds back and forth to the, um, the pa past tense and the um, you know, present tense or you know, that kind of thing um, and try to meld them into a new, a new uh, verb and a new tense that we have no name for, okay? And there's no, no word. As it is with the eternity of the Son, so it is with the eternity of the Holy Ghost. And it is in the eternal relations of the Father, the Son, and Holy Ghost within the one divine nature that the divine life is utterly lived. The mind can form only the most shadowy notion of what that life of three persons in one means in itself. What it means that within the divine simplicity, three should possess one another totally, give themselves to one another totally, utter their life secret to one another totally in the changeless stillness of the infinite life. Our greatest words are only a lisping or tinkling. The earlier theologians coined the word circumincession, the flow of vital activity within one another. Modern theologians alter one letter and make it circum... Wait, Circum in session. Oh, I thought it was the same word. Circum in session. C E S S I O N. Okay, I don't get it. Um, the utter repose of three dwelling within one another. Both words are significant and both are all but nothing. Okay, so that's the end of that chapter. We can go back to the other book. Now, um, we'll, we'll skip then to chapter 13. If you'd like, you can read chapter 12 about the Holy Trinity just to um, have you know, something in front of you that, that you have in your own book um, instead of trying to remember everything that we've said from reading from the other one. And, it, and it's very good. He talks about a lot of things. It, it's just less profound in a way and less poetic than Frank Sheed gets over here. All right, yes. When you were reading the chapter near the end, you said the sun is still being regenerated? Well, what he was saying is the, the ways of speaking about the relations in the Trinity um, all have flaws because of our language. So we could say the Father generated the Son, and that expresses something, but it expresses it in a past tense, okay? It still is a, a point in time. Uh, you could say, maybe it's a little more accurate to say is generating, but that implies a process that's not finished yet, that's ongoing. And neither is completely right, you say. He's just trying to make you aware of we only have so many ways to talk about events, and they all involve uh, some kind of time. You see, he's not saying that the Father is continuing to generate the Son. He was talking about that the limitation of saying it that way. Right. But now I'm, I'm thinking, won't you see the Son because he But no, more correctly, you'll, you'll see things the, go, the way God sees them. 
And that all will make sense to you. I mean, that, this, is, this is just a shadow of the reality of what we'll see in heaven. It's like St. Thomas Aquinas. You know, besides St. Augustine, probably the greatest writer on the faith in the whole history of the church, just, you know, St. Thomas Aquinas was just the biggest genius. You know, everybody talks about Einstein. Einstein could, would be Thomas Aquinas' shoeshine boy when it comes to intelligence. Um, St. Thomas Aquinas wrote volumes and volumes and volumes about God. Um, and in fact, he, he used to walk around the room and he had uh, secretaries, so to speak, um, scribes. And he would walk around the room and dictate six books simultaneously, all of them different. And when he got near the table and told, he told the one scribe what to write, he'd write down, you go to the next, he kept on walking around the room, dictating six books simultaneously. Now, if I could write one book and have it be any good whatsoever, I'd go, oh boy, you know? And all of his books are, they just, they define theology. <coughs> um, our Lord appeared to him and showed him just a, a little a vision of heaven, like for you know a second kind of thing, not not the beatific vision, but showed him the life of heaven and you know the re, some of the reality of the things he wrote about. And when he came back, he was all upset, and he said, "What I all, everything I've written is like, is like so much straw." And he didn't mean it, that in itself it was no good. It just means that when you get a, a glimpse of what the real thing is, all this is just, you know, Marvel Comics, you know, compared. And at the same time, you know, our Lord, knowing his, um, you know, how sad he was about, you know, not, or his feelings of inadequacy about what he had written, our Lord said to him, Bene scripsisti de me, you have written well of me. You know, so when you're thinking about the reality and what's down on paper, you know, think about what God himself said when he appeared to St. Thomas, you know, and after all that St. Thomas, was, in fact, I have this book on St. Thomas, if anybody would like to read a little, okay, here, I'll get it to you later. That's the pocket Aquinas. It's called, all right. So let's move on then. The next chapter then is about belief in Jesus Christ. What is the second article of the Apostles' Creed? It is, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. Who is Jesus Christ? He is God the Son, made man for us. Is Jesus Christ truly God? Yes, Jesus Christ is truly God. Why is Jesus Christ truly God? Jesus Christ is truly God because he has one and the same nature with God the Father. Was Jesus Christ always God? Jesus Christ was always God, born of the Father before, before all eternity. Now, once again here, let's divorce our minds a little bit from the language. Um, we, when we think of Jesus Christ, we think of the incarnation of the second person, right? The you know, picture of the Sacred Heart or something. There's Jesus Christ. Well, that's only after he took on human flesh in the incarnation. He was always Jesus Christ, God the Son. And uh, we'll go into the we'll go into the na the hypostatic union later on. We referred to the hypostasis, but um, so remember that Jesus Christ, as God the Son, exists in eternity, and until the incarnation, um, he he was pure spirit, like the Father and that at a certain point in human history took on flesh, uh, but still exists as eternal God. So, I know it's a bit mind-blowing, but there you go. Um, which person of the Blessed Trinity is Jesus Christ? He is the second person. Um, is he truly man? Yes. And so when we're talking about... Um, Jesus Christ is one in the same nature as the Father. We're not talking about his human nature. 
because God does not have God the Father does not have human a human nature. So we're talking about his God the Son's divine nature is is one and the same divine nature as possessed by God the Father. Um, was Jesus Christ always man? Jesus Christ was not always man. He has been man only from the time of his incarnation. What do you mean by the incarnation? By the incarnation, I mean that God the Son took to himself the nature of man. The word was made flesh. How many natures are there in Jesus Christ? There are two natures in Jesus Christ. The nature of God and the nature of man. Is there only one person in Jesus Christ? There is only one person in Jesus Christ, which is the person of God the Son. Why was God the Son made man? God the Son was made man to redeem us from sin and hell and to teach us the way to heaven. What does the holy name Jesus mean? It means Savior. And what does the name Christ mean? It means anointed. So we still use that um, christening. You know, christening refers to a baptism, but specifically to the anointings with oil in baptism. So um, Christ is called Christ, the, the christened one, the oiled one, because he is the, the anointed. You know, they, there, there are lots of words used for the Messiah. But that's a Greek word, yeah? Yeah, that's a Greek word. Um, yes, Christus. And in fact, in the Greek Orthodox Church, they talk about, um, they use that term, they use christening, and they also use a relative of it for uh, confirmation, chrismating, they call it. So, and chrism and Christos have the same origins. Okay. Uh, where is Jesus Christ? As God, Jesus Christ is everywhere. As God made man, he is in heaven in, and in the blessed sacrament of the altar. What rule of life must we follow if we are to be saved? We must follow the rule of life taught by Jesus Christ. What are we bound to do by the rule of life taught by Jesus Christ? We are bound always to hate sin and to love God. How are we to, to follow our blessed Lord? We are to follow our blessed Lord by walking in his footsteps and imitating his virtues. And finally, what are the principal virtues we are to learn of, of our blessed Lord? They are meekness, humility, and obedience. Okay, so... The summary of the doctrine. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven, sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. So that in a, is an, in a nutshell the doctrine um, of Jesus Christ. Now, every one of those words and sentences you can go on a lot more for, but it, the Apostles' Creed encapsulates the very essence of, of our belief. And that right there you have pretty much everything about our Lord that we're supposed to believe. It is the doctrine of the church that the God the Son, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, became man that he was born of the Virgin Mary, and he is true God and true man. Let us prove this last doctrine now. Jesus Christ is true God. Recall a scene which took place almost 2,000 years ago near the small town of Bethany, just a few miles from Jerusalem. It is hard, dry, barren country with hillsides littered with millions of limestone chips or else it is bare and volcanic. A small number of people are seen coming out of the town, walking very slowly towards the northeast. Their leader is a man, tall, handsome, impressive, but obviously filled with grief. 
Close behind him are two women, walking silently with bowed heads and clad in the attire of mourners. Following is a straggling procession of men and women, some alone, others in groups. And as we watch in silence, the leader begins to weep, and those nearest him in the procession remark softly one to another, see how he loved him. Across the road to the slopes of the Mount of Olives, they proceed to a place where the hollows in the rocks have been shaped into square chambers to serve as tombs. It is the cemetery of Bethany. Now one of those in the procession moves forward to lead the way to a tomb only recently closed. Before the entrance, they halt. It is sealed like all the others with a large stone. Still the leader is weeping softly as all eyes are fixed upon him. Quietly he turns to one of the women beside him saying, take away the stone. Immediately she replies, Lord, the air is foul by now. He has been four days dead. He turns slightly and looks at her. His gaze pierces her soul. Have I not told thee, he says, that if thou hast faith, thou wilt see God glorified. That is sufficient. With a gesture, she bids the men to remove the stone. The silence of amazement and expectation has fallen on the gathering. With the aid of crowbars, the stone is slowly rolled back. Now they watch every gesture and motion, standing a few feet from the entrance to the cave. He slowly raises his eyes upwards. He seems to forget his surroundings. He begins to pray, Father, he says, I give thee thanks that thou hast heard me. Now he seems to peer into the darkness of the tomb. There is a pause. Then raising his voice so that all can hear, he cries, Lazarus, come forth. What a terrifying moment. The tomb, a man dead for four days. The fixed eyes, the baited breath, the straining necks. Then suddenly at the entrance of the tomb, the dead man himself appears, covered with bandages, clothes, and wrappings. It is an apparition, a corpse walking, after a moment that seems like an eternity, the man who has caused this strange scene turns to those nearest him and says quietly, as if nothing out of the ordinary has happened, loose him and let him go. And he begins to move away. Immediately a babble of conversation and expressions of astonishment burst, burst forth. Lazarus, the man raised from the dead, is surrounded by an excited throng. They must convince themselves that he is really alive, that this is the same man whom they buried less than a week ago. Naturally, they begin to ask one another, who is this man that works such wonders? Who is he that brings the dead back to life? He is the carpenter of Nazareth, says one. He has cured lepers, says another. He raised a boy to life in name, says a third. He quelled the storm on the Sea of Galilee, contributes a fourth. Now what we're building up to is the notion and the, and the fact that there existed a person who was Jesus Christ. Um, went, walked around, and we have historic, uh, the, the Holy Land, we have historically accurate accounts of his life. The, the Gospels are historically accurate books. They're meant to be a history of the life of Jesus Christ. And he did and said certain things. Okay, so we're kind of at the beginning of um, that he did and said certain things notion. But one thing he did was he uh, raised other people. He did all these things they mentioned there. This account is he raised a man who had been dead for four days. He raised him back to life. Okay. Um, and this has implications, and this is what you want to keep in mind. It either means that, it means that, oh, let me put it this way, it means at the very least, the very least, that he is approved of by God, okay? That's the very least. It actually means much more than that. 
Why does it mean that? Because only God can raise somebody from the dead, and but he, he will do the miracle at the bidding of his saints or his prophets that he approves of. So remember, we have cases in the Old Testament of um, a boy being raised from the dead, for example, by a prophet, um, because God gave him his, you know, his power to raise the boy from the dead. He approved of. So a person then, in order to be approved of by God, can't be a scoundrel, can't be a liar, cannot be a deceiver. God does not approve of those kinds of people. God only approves of people who are honest and upright um, and holy. Okay? So that's where, that's where this is going now. So we, this means that at very least, Jesus, in order to be able to work miracles, um, was an upright, honest, and holy person approved of by God. It, it can also mean that he is God. No, but one or the other. He either is God or approved of by God. Or he could not do the miracles that are historically and accurately accounted in the scripture. So, this person, Christ, was foretold. The story of Jesus is told in certain important history books known as the Gospels that were written by his contemporaries. Not only that, this unique person had been prepared for during the thousands of years, during thousands of years. His life had been prophetically written in advance in amazing detail. Not one but many prophets had foretold numerous things concerning him. St. Augustine said that in fact, the entire of the Old Testament is written about Christ in one way or another, in the predictions and the foreshadowings in, in what happened to the people of the Old Testament, bringing them in a particular place and, and a particular direction. Okay, so not one but many prophets had foretold numerous things concerning him. All these prophecies converged upon and met in Christ. He was to be a real man of the seed of Adam, of Abraham, and of David. He was to be, nevertheless, a pre-existing supernatural being. Although he was the only just one, he was to suffer for the sins of his people, thereby redeeming them. And he was to establish an everlasting kingdom and to rule over the whole earth. Further, it was through the Savior that the non-Jewish peoples were to know and worship the God of the Jews. Through Jesus, Christ that to, through Jesus Christ that happened. Therefore, prophecy culminated in Christ, and with him the Old Testament Jewish revelation stopped. Examine well, and we're talking about his character now. Examine well the, the, the life and character of Christ. See in him a man who is without sin, a man who is acknowledged to be sinless even by his enemies, a man who is filled with every virtue, truth, fortitude, humility, gentleness, compassion, love, a man who is religious and prayerful, selfless and mortified. The people of his own day were in admiration at his doctrine. No age, no sex, no grade, no class distinction could stand between Christ and his people. Little children run to him from their mother's arms, attracted by his gentleness and charm. Public sinners, the dregs of humanity, find at his feet compassion and forgiveness. Even his enemies, who would have cast him from the brow of the cliff, are repulsed from doing so merely by the majesty of his presence and he goes his way. In him see the vigor of perfect manhood, combined with the tenderness of a mother's heart, authority with sympathy, the power to command with perfect accessibility. In him you cannot find a fault. Compare him with the greatest men who ever lived, with the philosophers of Greece, with the emperors of Rome, with the saints and holy men who have dwelt and died on this earth. Compare him with whomever you please, 
and you will find in him something that excels the virtue of them all. No character has ever been admitted to be so universally perfect and so absolutely harmonious in all its parts. Even the rationalist must admit that the portrait of Christ remains the most sublime that the artist called world history has ever painted. So that's important. Um, there are a lot of religious figures in history. And the difference is that their lives do not stand up to scrutiny. I mean, let's take Muhammad. How could you even compare Christ to Muhammad? Uh, Muhammad was a filthy, vulgar, murderous child molester. You know, he, he, he clothed that in the notion that he had to take an eight-year-old wife to protect her from all the evil of the world, right? And this kind of thing. But it, you can't change what it is. Um, Muhammad, in his life, murdered over 3,000 people at his own hands. And people want to, want to say Islam is the way to go. Well, why don't you look at the founder? Now, I've talked to Muslims. And guess what? They're not allowed to study the life of Muhammad. It's, it's one of those verboten things. They can't read the Bible. They're not allowed to read the Old Testament or the New Testament or anything like that. Um, see, their, their rules make it so they, they can't have access to the truth and make any kind of a decision. But there is no comparison. You see? I mean, you can even take Buddha, who began life as a wayward, you know, uh, rich young man and all this kind of stuff and then went on to seek enlightenment okay so maybe he got his so called enlightenment but it doesn't make him anything close to Jesus because his enlightenment turned out to be a bunch of nonsense okay so you can take any religious figure you like in the whole history of the world and Jesus Christ is beyond compare there are even, even prophets and saints um while they are, they are wonderful and good and certainly in heaven, they, they, the, the Christ is, is still um, the, the shining light, head and shoulders above, above them all in all of his virtues. Because every saint usually had some little bad period or something like that in their life. Whereas we don't talk about, you know, Jesus' wild years or anything like that, you know where he went and became a soldier or something, you know, and, and whatever. He didn't have those. There was, there was nothing. And as he said, even his enemies found nothing they could accuse him of, of any substance. Um, they had to admit that there was nothing to, nothing to get him on. All right, so the power of Christ. Add to the charm of his character his power. See him walking on the waves of the sea. See him raise aloft his hand to still the raging gale. Present yourself at the funeral procession when he halts the little company of mourners and restores the young man back to his widowed mother. <clears throat> Stand by while he heals the sick, the blind, the lame, the dumb, by a mere word and even at a distance. Then listen to him appealing to his miracles as proof that he is sent by God. He says, for the works which the Father hath given me to perfect, the, words them, the works themselves which I do give testimony of me that the Father hath sent me. So even if for a moment you do not admit that Jesus Christ is God, you must at least conclude that God is with him, that at least he uses the power of God that at least what he says and does is guaranteed by God. In other words, if he has any message for the world, if he has any claims to make, that message and those claims must be true, sealed with a divine guarantee of truth. Because he, he did the things he did and was the kind of person he was, um, he is utterly approved of by God and God is with him. And so what he says has got to be true because God wouldn't, wouldn't approve of and give his power 
to a deceiver or to a liar. Understand? So what are his claims then? He says, um, he claimed to be, I am he, the Messiah. He says, I am he. You know, when they said, are you the Messiah? He says, I am he. Okay. He claimed to be the judge of all men. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit down upon the throne of his glory and all nations shall be gathered into his presence. See, he's saying this about himself. Now, if he were making that up, God wouldn't give him the power to, to do the things he did. And God wouldn't appear, uh, appeal, uh, would not approve of somebody who made these things up. He claimed to be the Lord of the Sabbath. The, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And he makes himself equal to God, the lawgiver of the old law. He claims the right to enlarge and interpret the Ten Commandments of his own personal authority. And he does this more than once. You know, he, he says, um, you have heard it said, you know, whatever, but I tell you this. Okay, he, 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 he says different, in different times during, in the Bible he does that. Um, for example, uh, when he was talking about divorce, he said, you know, he says, Moses allowed the Israelites to divorce because they're of the hardness of their hearts. But I tell you, you know, encapsulating, encapsulating, that's not the way it was supposed to be. That's not the way it was intended to be by God. This is the way it was intended to be, that, you know, you're, you're, you're bound until death do you part and you can't divorce. Uh, he claimed to be all-powerful, a divine person, equal to the Father in power, and to be, in fact, God the Son. All power is given to me in heaven and earth. All things are delivered to me by my Father, and no one knoweth who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and to whom the Son will reveal him. Moreover, he praised St. Peter when the apostle proclaimed him to be God the Son. Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answering said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, because flesh and blood hath not revealed it to thee, but, that, but my Father who is in heaven. On the occasion of his trial before the high priest, Jesus was asked, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the blessed God? Jesus said to him, I am. The priest understood this as blasphemy. He has blasphemed. What was the blasphemy if not that Jesus claimed to be the true Son of God, one in nature with the Father? So, if, um, if someone says to you, art thou the Christ, the Son of the living God, and you say yes and you're not, then you're blaspheming. But if you say yes and you are, you're simply telling the truth. There was nothing else that Jesus could have said at that point. Because if he, if he said no, then he would, have been, he would have been lying, which is sinful. And he, was, he couldn't sin. Uh, St. John tells us of several instances in which Jesus made similar claims. Before Abraham was made, I am. For as the Father raiseth up the dead and giveth life, so the Son also giveth life to whom he will. Now glorify thou me, O Father, with thyself. All my things are thine, and thine are mine. It is clear, too, that the Jews understood Jesus to claiming to be God. For a good work we stone thee not, answered the Jews, but for blasphemy. And because that thou being a man makest thyself God. And we just had it in a recent gospel um, where the, the Jews, okay, the Jews saw what he did and they hear what he said. And then, so they go to him, it's by the hand of Beelzebub that you are casting out demons. Why did they say that? And in, you, know, you know what follows what he says to them, it's not by the hand of Beelzebub. Um, but if it is by the hand of Beelzebub, who do you cast them out by? All right? Now, the reason is they accuse him of driving out demons by 
Beelzebub, which didn't make any sense, as he pointed out. Because if they believed that, that he drove out demons by the hand of God, then, then God was with him. And they would have to accept him and what he said as being the Messiah. And they wouldn't do it. They didn't want to do it. So they kept on coming with these things. Like, you know, yes, you're casting out demons by another demon because that's where your power comes from. And they couldn't answer him as to, well, who do your people cast them out then by? And a, a, a kingdom divided against itself could not stand, showing them that what they're saying was nonsense. Uh, Hereupon, therefore, the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he said God was his father, making himself equal to God. Then Jesus answered, As the Father raiseth up the dead and giveth life, so the Son also giveth life to whom he will. Before Pilate, he said, The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to the law he ought to die, because he has made himself the Son of God. Again, Jesus did or allowed certain acts which are in themselves an implicit claim to divinity. For example, he forgave sins as of his own independent power. Son, thy sins are forgiven. But the scribes who were present thought to themselves, who can forgive sins? God only. Um, and what, what happens then? He says, but that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. And it's true that only God can forgive sins, right? But I have that power, therefore guess what? Guess who I am? Um, what does he do afterwards? He says, you know, take up your, uh, take up your bed or whatever it was and, and, and go. Okay, arise. There was a cripple, remember? A guy who, who was a paraplegic or quadriplegic, huh? Take up your bed and go into the house. Yeah, take up your bed and go to the house. He, goes, well, what should, he says, what's it easier to do? Tell somebody their sins are forgiven or, or to tell, tell them to uh, arise and to cure them? And he says, just to show you that I have power in heaven and earth and, it, and it's, you know, it's from God, he tells them, okay, get up, take your bed and go to your house. And the guy is instantly cured and goes to his house proving by his miracle that his words of forgiving sins are true and that he isn't in fact God. They were, they were right. Only God can forgive sins. So if, if someone cures them and so, tells somebody their sins are forgiven, then he is approved of by God and those words were true. Okay? And he is in fact God. And they know it. They keep on trying to stump him up on this. Let me just finish this one little section here. He accepted adoration. Dost thou believe in the Son of God? I believe, Lord. And falling down, he adored him. Um, now, you see, had he been anything but God, and he was a holy man, like picture Isaiah or Elijah or, or one of these, um, that somebody walked, fell down and adored them. They would immediately object. They'd say, you only adore God. Get up, get up. But he accepted the adoration. Why? Because it was proper to him. He had it coming because he, he was God. It is abundantly clear that the apostles and disciples knew that Christ claimed to be God. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. The author of life you killed, St. Peter told the Jews, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Okay, so we shall continue with that next week. Any other questions? Let's see. In the name of the Father, and Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Our Lady, seat of wisdom, and Father, and Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. All right.